Hello, Year 8 chemists. This lady is holding a beaker, and the beaker is holding a wooden block in the middle of the air. At the start of the experiment that she was doing, the beaker and the wooden block were easy to separate. And after the experiment, the beaker was able to lift the wooden block. But how did this happen? This is what we're going to be finding out in today's lesson. So today's lesson will need you to turn to your book pages, page 90 in your textbook. And the topic is energy transfer in reactions. And here's a picture of another experiment. Experiments like this are something that you would commonly think of when you think of the word chemistry. But it's really important to know that you actually have chemical experiments that release stored heat energy and also become colder. There are also other experiments that, be, that feel cold and cause heat energy to be removed from the environment as it's absorbed by the chemical reactions. So what I'm trying to say is that in chemistry, you pretty much find that there are two different types of reactions. One type feels hot like this, and the other, just like the uh, picture that you saw at the start of the video, can make the surroundings feel cold. Uh, it gives you a clue as to what is actually in the video itself. But let's introduce ourselves to a couple of new terms for this lesson. So I'm going to introduce and start to talk to you about two terms. There are two keywords, really important keywords, that you will need to know. And it's very, very important that you get to know the meaning of these keywords to make sure that you get them the right way around. And also to make sure that when you are using these keywords, you're using them correctly and talking about energy being transferred in the right direction. So some chemicals will produce heat. And a nice example would be the fires that you find when you go on your desert safaris to keep you warm on the cold desert nights. So that's, a, that's an example of a chemical reaction that produces heat. Now, when you actually have a chemical reaction that transfers energy, that energy originally is kept and stored inside the chemicals of whatever it is that you're reacting. Perhaps it might be a fuel, it might be a piece of wood. Now, all of that energy was stored, stored on the, on the inside of maybe all the chemicals that were there. And when you do your chemical reaction, you transfer that energy from where it was stored inside the chemicals to the surroundings. So that energy moves, it's transferred to the surroundings from where the chemicals are to the surroundings. And we feel that perhaps it's partly due to a bit of infrared radiation that we may feel very instantly. So infrared radiation is part of the electromagnetic spectrum and we recognize infrared radiation, we recognize it as heat. So when our the skin, when our skin surfaces feel infrared radiation, for example, if a, a sun comes out from behind a cloud on a sunny day, we feel that warmth, and that is due to infrared radiation. So maybe there might be a little bit of infrared radiation coming from, coming from these reactions, and we'll feel it instantly. Or it could be, perhaps, warm particles. They could be molecules. So warm molecules coming from your chemical reaction, bumping into air particles that are surrounding the chemical reaction that you're, you're conducting. And those 
particles that started off in your chemical reaction are bumping into those air particles and you get a transfer of energy that way. So perhaps it's a moving gas particle. It's a gas particle because of the, the high temperatures of these types of reactions. And those gas particles hit air particles and then those air particles hit more and more air particles until eventually we get hit by those air particles and our skin detects that and the particles inside our skin start to vibrate a little more and our brains then interpret that as being something that's hot and can warn us if it's too hot. So the journey that the vibrations and the stored heat energy can take can be quite a quite an elaborate and long description if we were to just try and summarize it but normally what happens is we just say oh it's a bang and we can feel it's hot but you have to understand that that energy started off as a store in these chemical reactions and that journey eventually gets to us through different means. So examples of exothermic reactions. An exothermic reaction is a chemical reaction that transfers energy from a chemical, which is a store of energy, to its surroundings. This is an exothermic reaction. Now, what usually happens in an exothermic reaction is that the surroundings start to warm up. And remember I was talking to you about how the air particles in the surroundings could vibrate a little more? Or maybe there might be some infrared radiation that warms those air particles up as well. So if the surroundings start to warm up, the particles start to move faster and faster, they store more energy inside those, and what we can then do is we could put a thermometer could put a thermometer to measure the temperature around it we would expect the thermometer reading to go up and the reason why is because these particles could be bumping into the bulb of the thermometer causing the thermometer reading to rise because when your air particles that are in this warm surroundings bump into the glass the glass particles start to move faster they then transfer energy to the liquid inside your thermometer and your liquid particles start to move faster they start to occupy on average a larger volume and as a result we see the liquid expanding up our thermometer and we can see that the temperature of the bulb of the thermometer is rising. It's very important for us to realize how a thermometer works when we are talking about exothermic and endothermic reactions. So a, a thermometer measures the temperature around the bulb. That's what a thermometer does. It measures the temperature around the bulb. So if the bulb and the glass around the, th the bulb if that is starting to move and vibrate more, then the liquid particles on the inside of the thermometer will start to vibrate more and they will start to move faster. The volume will go up because the volume is expanding as the particles move much faster and that causes a temperature rise. So it was so if we have a th an exothermic reaction and that exothermic reaction is transferring energy from that set of chemicals that are reacting to the surroundings, if we have a thermometer bulb that is in contact with that temperature change, with that transfer of energy, some of that energy is gonna go into the bulb and then cause the temperature reading to rise. So we could have a very quick chemical reaction with 
a very rapid energy transfer. Combustion, which is what we studied last lesson, setting fire to things. Explosions, firework explosions. So fireworks, when they explode in and around the Burj Khalifa or on special events, the temperature of most fireworks is at least 1,500 degrees centigrade. And even sparklers have a temperature of about 2,000. We have to be very careful when we handle sparklers. Once a sparkler goes out, we have to, and we must, put it in a glass of cold water to make sure that it cools down and we don't scar ourselves. So, examples of exothermic reactions include those. But there is another example of a reaction that actually, when it takes place, it actually takes in energy from its surroundings. The surroundings feel cool. Now, how does that work? And what, in fact, does it have on the thermometer? Well, if a chemical reaction is taking place and energy is actually, during the chemical reaction, being absorbed by the chemicals, then whatever is surrounding the chemical reaction is going to lose some of its store of heat energy to the chemicals that are reacting. Now, how does that impact on a thermometer? Well, before I told you that the liquid inside a thermometer contains particles and they're moving around and they have a set amount of energy that they store within them. Now, if they are placed inside a set of chemicals that are reacting and those chemicals are absorbing energy, they are going to be absorbing energy from the bulb of the thermometer. Now, that energy was inside the liquid of the thermometer, and now what happens is, as the liquid starts to lose energy, the liquid particles stop moving around so much, and they slow down. They're still a liquid, but they slow down. Now, if they were to slow down completely, what do you think could happen to the liquid? Think about it. I hope you were able to say that if the liquid particles lose too much energy, they get stuck and the particles stick together, and that is actually freezing. So, let's assume that freezing does not take place just yet. Let's assume that the liquid particles, however, start losing energy. Now, if they start losing energy, they can't move around so much. And they're still a liquid, so they can't move around so much, and therefore the volume that they start to occupy decreases because the liquid volume is contracting. Now, where is this energy going to? That energy is being supplied to chemicals in this situation, chemicals that are absorbing energy energy. Now, if we have a chemical reaction and it's absorbing energy, it won't just cause a decrease in the thermometer reading. It's also going to have an effect on the surroundings. So maybe there's some stored energy inside the beaker. Maybe there's some stored energy in the air surrounding it. If we were to hold the beaker, some of the energy inside our fingers would be absorbed, it would be transferred from our fingertips to the actual chemical reaction that is absorbing energy. When we have that type of chemical reaction, we can class that as being an endothermic reaction. Endothermic reactions take in energy and the mixture that we have of the reactants when they're reacting, that mixture will then feel cold. It's the opposite of an exothermic reaction. An exothermic reaction feels warm because it's transferring energy outwards. So if we were to hold the beaker, we would be feeling some of this energy going into our fingertips. So we have two different types of chemical reaction that could take place. One's an exothermic reaction, which releases energy to its surroundings and causes a temperature reading on a thermometer to go up. It feels warm. The other is an endothermic reaction, 
which absorbs energy from its surroundings. It causes a temperature reading of a thermometer inside the reaction to decrease and it feels cold. There is a way of thinking about the energy, and I find this is really useful. Exo means it exits. So we're talking about the energy exiting the reaction that's taking place. Endo, you could think of the endothermic reaction. Endo sounds like in, so it's taking in energy from the surroundings. And that causes a decrease in the temperature reading. So whenever we're measuring exothermic and endothermic reactions, we've got to realise that these beakers are made of glass and we put, we put reaction mixtures in glass above Bunsen burners to warm them up so we know that glass is a very good conductor. Now if we've got something like this and we're trying to calculate how much energy, we can do some calculations. If we're trying to calculate, we want to be able to measure changes like this very accurately. We want to make sure that there's the temperature changes represent a true value. You see, if we actually have temperature changes that are not the true value, our calculations could be off. Perhaps some of the energy could be lost out here, out of the beaker, into the air. But the only thing that we can measure is the temperature reading of the end of the bulb here. So we've got to try and make sure that as much energy is not lost through the walls here as much energy is actually warming the end of this bulb so we can then do some calculations. In a very similar way, we've got to make sure that if we're doing an energy calculation for an endothermic reaction, we don't want energy to be coming in from the surroundings. We want all of the energy to be coming and being supplied by the end of this thermometer bulb. So what we try and do is we try and cover the surroundings. We try and stop stop energy from uh, being surrounded, uh, from surrounding the uh, chemical, from entering the chemical right here. We want all of the energy to be transferred from the bulb. Why? Because that then helps us understand exactly how much energy is being absorbed. We can do a calculation once we know what the differences in temperature are. So when we do this type of scientific investigation. This type of scientific investigation is called calorimetry. And what we do, and what the page is showing you, is that we do take steps to insulate the beaker to reduce energy loss out of the beaker if we are doing a study on exothermic reactions or into the beaker of reacting chemicals if we are studying endothermic reactions. And that's what this passage summarizes. Now it's very important for us to also know that there are some chemical reactions that do take place that don't just involve heat energy transfer but also light energy transfer. Photosynthesis for example is a very good example of light being supplied to cause a chemical reaction to take place. We've studied photosynthesis. So photosynthesis, what about photosynthesis? Do you think it's an exothermic reaction or do you think it's an endothermic reaction based on what we've studied? Pause the video. Well, I hope you said that it was an endothermic reaction because it has absorbed energy in the form of infrared radiation from the sun that could help start off the chemical reaction but also we've got to remember also that there are other members of the family of the electromagnetic spectrum that will trigger off photosynthesis. It's absorbing light which is on the red end of the visible light spectrum and also the blue end of the visible light spectrum. It just completely ignores the green parts of visible light. Remember there's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet. Those are the colours that we study for what's in visible light. 
and the green light just bounces off. It's not absorbed. It's not absorbed by the chemical reactions. So that is the reason why we see leaves as green. But photosynthesis is an endothermic reaction. It requires certain types of light energy, not heat, to be transferred to the reacting chemicals. But of course, plants will not grow on a an extremely cold day. You do need a little bit of warmth just to make sure that the water stays as water as it passes through the stems and into the leaf and supplies plants with their water for photosynthesis. So when an energy transfer that takes place, this is usually evidence that a chemical reaction has happened even if the reactants themselves don't appear to change. So we could be watching two colourless liquids but if and they might not be looking as if they're doing anything but if there is a, a temperature change that we can detect whether it's upwards or downwards we know that there is a chemical reaction and remember that energy transfer in or out is not always heat we could actually have the absorption of light we could also have sound being released by our chemical reaction as well so what really brings about that change in temperature? Well, it's all to do with what happens during a chemical reaction. So pretty much this is what represents a, a chemical reaction. This is just a, an example of a chemical reaction taking place Let's say, for example, there's this particle here, and it wants to join on with that one there and that one there, and it will release this. Now, a great example of this could be, could be um, a metal reacting with an acid to form a gas. That might, might take place. So, what actually happens? Well, let's say, for example, it is something like a metal reacting with an acid or it could be looking over here this looks like a water molecule so this could be something like a water molecule reacting with a very reactive metal let's say that metal is potassium so the reaction of potassium and water creates potassium hydroxide as a product and so potassium and water react to form, there's a rearrangement, potassium hydroxide, and it knocks out a hydrogen atom from water, H2O, and this would be your hydrogen gas. So potassium plus water reacts to form potassium hydroxide and hydrogen. Quite interesting because this is actually quite balanced as well. So what actually happens during a chemical reaction? So during a chemical reaction, what happens is you actually need to break up some bonds. So let's say for all intents and purposes this requires a little bit of energy, so does this, so does this, so does this, to break them up. And then what happens is you can get energy back when chemical bonds are made. So when this joins up with that and that joins up with that, that will actually release energy. So all of these will release energy. The two hydrogens, hydrogen atoms, combine to form a hydrogen molecule. That also releases energy as well. If in a chemical reaction, you need more energy as a number to break up every particle, then you need, then you actually get from making your new particles, so if you need more energy to do this step and less en and you get less energy from here it's as if the entire system takes in energy overall so i'll say that again if you are putting in more energy than you are getting from new bonds forming if you're putting more energy to break bonds than you are from getting, and, uh, getting new bonds, then 
what will actually happen is overall you are putting in energy into this chemical reaction for it to take place. Even though you're getting some energy back on this side, it's not enough to pay the cost of breaking up all the atoms. Now, if that was the case, you're putting in more energy than you are getting out, that would be an endothermic reaction. If, on the other hand, you release a huge amount of energy and you only needed to put in a little bit of energy to break the bonds, in effect, overall, you have a reaction that releases energy. Now, the release of the energy does need to pay for the breaking of these bonds here, but you get so much more out of it, and those reactions would then overall release energy. Even after you've broken up these, it would release energy, and those reactions would be exothermic reactions. So, to summarise, Energy is needed to break bonds between atoms in the reactants and to make new bonds between atoms in the products. In our example, we had potassium reacting with water. The bonds between the hydrogen and oxygen atoms in the water molecule have to be broken. New bonds have to be formed between the potassium, oxygen and hydrogen atoms. But not all bonds are the same. They vary in how much energy is required to break them or make them. As a chemical reaction involves rearranging atoms, the types and number of bonds broken will not be the same as those made. If you spend more breaking bonds than you get making bonds, overall you have to put in energy, and that would be an endothermic reaction. If you get out more energy from making bonds than you needed to spend when you broke the bonds, overall you would get energy coming out of your chemical reaction, even though you had to spend some. You still get energy coming out, and that would be an exothermic reaction. So what I've got in my lesson is I've got a video. It's around about 10 minutes. I'm going to ask you to watch that video. It's got some examples of exothermic and endothermic reactions being been uh, done by uh, scientists and then I've got a quick quiz to test you on energy transfer. Thank you very much for watching. Take care, stay home, stay safe. Bye.